Thank you. Well, Jonathan last week became the Bemis Professor of Law, and he is also a professor at the Kennedy School and at the Engineering School, as well as uh, the faculty director of the Harvard Law Library. So he's big in many, many respects. But uh, I don't know. Do I ask for a vote? How many people think he was big in the first sense or the second sense? We'll do this at the end. We'll do this at the end. Our next speaker is uh, Elizabeth or Betsy Bartholet, who's going to speak on finding the child and child welfare. Um, it, it was in 2004 that uh, Betsy started the Child Advocacy Program. It's hard to believe it's 10 years, but it's an extraordinary program that uh, actually equips a whole new generation to understand the range of ways in which advocacy can proceed and what's worked and not worked on behalf of children. And uh, her, her talk will reflect that, but it will also reflect not only her own scholarship and her own very uh, effective advocacy, but her lifelong work as an advocate in civil rights and public interest work, first at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and later as the founder and director of the Legal Action Center, Betsy Bartholet. So thank you, Dean Martha Minow. Um, so um, my topic's not funny, and I'm not sure I'm as funny as Jonathan Zittrain, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, so finding the child in child welfare, it is supposed to be, on seems on the surface, a child welfare system. And a lot of my work for the past three decades has had to do with this child welfare system, which addresses child abuse and neglect and is supposed to protect children against parental abuse and neglect, and the protection can be done in various ways. The child protection system, I'll call it CPS, because there is one in every state with a different initials uh, name. Um, the, the CPS system has the power to intervene, to monitor families, to take them to court, uh, to get court-ordered uh, drug treatment or anger management uh, classes or whatever, or um, in extreme cases um, to remove children to foster care and in more extreme cases to move to terminate parental rights and have the children adopted. So that's our child protective, child welfare system. Um, the question I'm raising obviously is, does it really have to do with child Welfare. So I'm going to um, highlight two stories that I think many of you will be familiar with. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with one, maybe the other. They both featured big time in the Boston Globe, particularly the first. So the first is the Jeremiah Oliver case. This is the boy who um, born, uh, brought up by parents who suffered from both uh, drug and alcohol problems, lived in Connecticut for a period of time, officially under the supervision in some sense of Connecticut's CPS system, never removed from his parents. The family moved to Massachusetts. He was then officially transferred, but not much happened between the Connecticut and the Massachusetts CPS system. He was officially monitored by CPS in Massachusetts, but as you, many of you will have read in the newspapers, actually the social worker just stopped showing up. It was difficult. People didn't necessarily come to the door. Um, she stopped going, uh, even though there were tons of red flags in this case. The, uh, uh, system and the rest of us learned that Jeremiah had disappeared, had in fact been disappeared for many months when his sister said, Jeremiah's not around. And by the way, I saw our um, father or stepfather, I can't remember which, uh, knocking him off a toilet and uh, maybe he'd cut off one of his fingers. And then they started looking for Jeremiah who finally showed up dead. Um, the other case that didn't get as much play, but there was a long, excellent investigative uh, reporting article on Baby Maya. So Baby Maya, one of an increasing number of children in this and other states, born drug-affected, uh, 
born addicted to heroin, which means born in a desperately fragile state in intensive care for probably the six, first six weeks of her life, sent home as is the case uh, systematically, not 100% of the time, but most of the time in Massachusetts, sent home to her still uh, drug addicted parents and died um, a few months, I think it was, later or weeks, I'm, I'm not sure, of um, some in connection with a heroin laced uh, baby bottle. Um, that story also reported on many other children in Massachusetts, born drug affected, sent home with a drug affected, drug uh, addicted parents who died. Um, but what we know from the social science is that most of these kids who are sent home um, will, if they obviously, most of them don't die right away, um, but most of them probably most of them are abused and neglected and many, many of them show up after that abuse and neglect is discovered several years later, they may be removed to foster care, um, by which time they likely have been very significantly damaged. The children born addicted to um, drugs like heroin and cocaine, which scare everybody, if those kids are placed in early infancy in nurturing families, the social science shows that they do very well, close to normal parameters. Most of the damage to those kids comes when they go home. Um, so what is the net of those two stories in terms of of what I see going on with Massachusetts um, and most states' child protective, child welfare system. I think the net in terms of problems that I see, and there are many different versions of what different people see, but what I see is a combination of problems that have to do with unduly limited resources. As with most systems that serve children, this is a system starved for resources. Secondly, I think it's a system unduly oriented to what gets called family preservation. I question whether it's really a family from the child's point of view if it's incapable, parents incapable of nurturing. Um, but it's called family preservation and there's a very high premium um, that relates to the reasons we do family preservation and on adult parent rights. Um, so um, what happens when stories come out like this? Well, what we hear from people like our current governor and the gubernatorial candidates is wringing of hands and they will or would do better, more resources to CPS. Um, and part of what I wanna to say to you is even if that might be true, not enough, because I think there are two problems with what's going on, undue orientation to family preservation as well as limited resources. So what I wanna talk about is the major child reform move in Massachusetts and throughout the nation. So that while Governor Patrick can tell us that um, you know he's gonna make sure we get more resources to CPS that'll better protect Jeremiah Oliver, the fact is there is a movement that Massachusetts has bought into called differential response and that now a majority of the states in the United States have bought into called differential response. We aren't doing it 100%, but um, it's the goal of the people pushing differential response, which I'll call DR to try to stay within my um, minutes. Uh, uh, um, the, 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 those pushing DR, um, their goal is, uh, in an overall sense, two things. Um, their goal is family preservation, more of it. We should take 70% of the kids who hit the CPS screen, not who are removed, but who hit the screen. Kids like Jeremiah Oliver, because most of the kids they're gonna take are in this neglect category, as was Jeremiah Oliver, the one murdered and disappeared and just found. Um, so the goal is remove 70% of the families that are now in some sense being looked at by CPS and um, put them on a voluntary track, a totally voluntary track where you simply ask the parents if they would like to cooperate with services and then offer services um, if the parents say yes, they'd like to cooperate. 
Um, the second aspect of differential response is, well, you have to figure out where's the money coming from for this new track. So it turns out the money is coming from the already starved CPS system. So the goal of this movement is to go to the federal government and persuade the federal government to divert a substantial chunk of the money the federal government now pays to states for their child welfare systems to divert funds from the CPS system to this new voluntary track. So we will further starve CPS. And the reason this works so beautifully for the proponents of the movement is that they really want to reduce CPS intervention in families because they think it isn't sufficiently family friendly and that we should be doing more um, family preservation, less removal of kids. Um, so the net, and I will sum up since I'm being told stop, 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 um, by my red button here. So um, the net for me is that it's an adult welfare system, not a child welfare system. Um, interestingly, it's being pushed by people who call themselves child welfare people. So the Annie E. Casey that you hear about on NPR all the time as a child protective foundation, it is the Casey foundations with their monumental wealth that are promoting DR and it's very hard for anybody to stand up to it because they fund almost all the research that tells us why DR is so good as well as the uh, policy advocacy um, that's designed to push it forward. So why are the organizations that call themselves the child-friendly organizations doing this? I think because after the lifetime that Martha referred to in terms of various uphill causes, I've come to think that children are perhaps with a lot of competition out there, but they may be the ultimate powerless group that it's very easy for others to use on behalf of various other groups. So thank you.